Chapter 91 The King of Horned Camels Cassandra's Astonishment Blake held his nose as he approached the unconscious mountain giant, grimacing at the foul odor emanating from it. This thing reeks as if it just emerged from a sewer, he thought to himself. His first concern was to determine whether this creature could be classified as a fantastic beast. Given its humanoid appearance, it was a gray area. Many humanoid creatures are considered humans rather than magical beasts, such as giants. Thus, Blake was uncertain if he could tame the mountain troll in the same way he might tame other creatures. To ensure Cassandra couldn't witness his attempt, Blake positioned himself to block her view. However, he soon realized he was overly cautious. The stench of the mountain troll was so overpowering that Cassandra had already distanced herself as far as possible, paying no attention to Blake's actions. Turning his back to Cassandra, Blake allowed his druid magic to flow freely, directing it towards the mountain giant's small, coconut-like head. He braced himself, expecting the process to consume a significant amount of his druid mana. To his surprise, the task required only a minimal amount, and soon enough, an additional entry for a mountain troll appeared on Blake's Fantastic Beasts panel. This indicated that the creature was now under his control. This was easier than expected, Blake mused, reflecting on how many wizards train mountain trolls as guards for various locations. Given his archdruid abilities, it shouldn't have been surprising that he could tame the creature with such ease. With a sense of accomplishment, Blake commanded the now subdued mountain troll. Unlike those tamed by other wizards, which could inadvertently harm allies, Blake's control ensured the creature would remain docile and not lash out unpredictably. Stepping back, Blake pointed his wand at the large bump on the troll's head and uttered, Back to the original. Moments later, the mountain giant stirred to life, sitting up and looking around with surprisingly wise eyes. Upon noticing Blake, it seemed to recognize him as its master. Cassandra, witnessing the scene, was utterly shocked. The troll has woken up. What's happening here? She stammered, her worry resurfacing as the troll quickly obeyed Blake's commands. Blake, still holding his nose, gestured for Cassandra to stay back as he instructed the mountain giant to stand. The creature, though confused about why it should listen to Blake, decided not to overthink it and complied, grabbing a large stick polished by a nearby tree. Go to the cave entrance and challenge me, Blake ordered, to which the troll responded with a puzzled, Provocation? What do you mean by provocation? Blake sighed, momentarily forgetting the creature's limited intellect. Simplifying his command, he said, Go there, call out. Obediently, the mountain troll dragged its club towards the cave entrance, leaving Blake to conjure a breeze with his wand to dissipate the lingering stench. Cassandra, still in disbelief, asked, You, you tamed it? A mountain troll? That's right, Blake confirmed, freshening the air around them with a cleansing charm. He explained his unique talent for attracting and taming fantastic beasts, a skill that seemed as natural to him as breathing and one that could not be taught or learned by others. As they spoke, the unicorn Karina approached, nuzzling Blake affectionately. His affinity for magical creatures was indeed a rare gift, akin to that of a born transformation magus, utilizing an instinct as natural and effortless as any innate ability. Eating and drinking might seem like instinctive skills to most, but in the wizarding world, possessing a unique magical talent is far from unusual. For wizards like Dumbledore, the revelation that Blake was a man-made life form only made his awakening of special abilities more plausible. This identity provided Blake with a convenient excuse for his extraordinary actions, eliminating the need for explanations about his nature. Cassandra Obsi arved the unicorn's affinity for Blake with awe. Unicorns, known for their reluctance to let wizards mount them, and a group of bow truckles, which seemed eager to follow him, were clear indicators of Blake's exceptional talent. He had the rare ability to attract and tame various magical creatures. Understanding this, Cassandra realized why Blake was so drawn to the Forbidden Forest. With his unique gift, it was as welcoming to him as a home. She admitted to herself that, were she in his shoes, she would frequent the forest as well. Meanwhile, a mountain troll had arrived at the entrance of a cave, brandishing its club and emitting a terrible cry that resembled the sound of a broken drum being beaten frantically. 
The noise was unbearable even for Blake and Cassandra, who stood at a distance. The creature that emerged from the cave in response to the troll's call was a sight to behold. It resembled a leopard with a raised back, covered in purple scales, with two sharp golden horns atop its head, similar to a saber-toothed tiger, but with numerous slippery tentacles around its mouth. What kind of creature is this? Cassandra inquired, her extensive family background notwithstanding. It's a purple-horned beast, though most refer to it as a horned camel, Blake explained. It's classified as a XXXXX-level creature, similar to the mountain troll, but this one is exceptional. It's likely the strongest horned camel living on the outskirts of the Forbidden Forest. Only a true leader among its kind could claim such a cave for itself. Blake admired the horned camel, which was significantly larger than its peers, with satisfaction. The mountain troll, upon seeing the horned camel, displayed a naive smile, unaware of the old enmity between their species. Mountain trolls often attempted to tame horned camels, usually resulting in the trolls being severely beaten. The horned camel, provoked by the mountain troll's display of might, charged with incredible speed and collided with the troll, sending it flying through the air before it crashed into the sand, unconscious. The horned camel then returned to its cave with a disdainful snort. Blake's eyes sparkled with admiration for the horned camel's prowess. He mused about the potential of training it further, likening it to empowering a tiger with wings. Blake and Cassandra then rode the unicorn to the beach, not far from the mountains. Upon dismounting, Blake inspected the mountain troll, which, though severely injured and barely alive, had survived the encounter. This incident highlighted the horned camel's ferocity. With his wand in hand, Blake cast a powerful healing spell, mending the troll's injuries and reviving it. He then allowed the creature to return to the Forbidden Forest, demonstrating a blend of strength and mercy. Blake decided it was best not to linger any longer, fearing the possibility of provoking the horned camel once more. Without the presence of Blake to intervene, the creature would likely face a grim fate. Okay, let's head back. Blake announced, returning to where Cassandra waited. Together, they mounted the unicorn, preparing to depart. Are we going to pass through the territory of the Acromantula again? Cassandra inquired, her voice tinged with apprehension. Blake pondered for a moment, scratching his chin thoughtfully. Actually, we could take a detour. It's a bit longer, but it would allow us to explore a few more habitats of magical creatures tonight. However, it means we might return to the castle late. Cassandra, still shaken from their earlier encounter, quickly dismissed her concerns. It's okay to be late. I just... really would rather not go through those spiders' territory again, she admitted. Blake nodded in understanding. All right, then. Just make sure you don't fall asleep in tomorrow's transfiguration class, he joked. With a neigh, Karina the unicorn surged forward. It was clear that unicorns, even by the standards of horses, were exceptional creatures, possessing a grace and speed unmatched by ordinary steeds. Yet few had the privilege to ride one as Blake did. Their return journey was markedly safer than their venture out. Along the way, they encountered the habitat of the ball-stalking bird. Blake paused to collect several of its feathers. Despite the bird's inability to fly, its ability to teleport made its feathers highly valuable. Next, they visited the habitat of the soundless bird a creature of stunning beauty that remained silent until its final moments. When it did vocalize, it would release all the sounds it had absorbed throughout its life, starting with the most recent. Blake collected some of its feathers as well, noting their usefulness in concocting veritaserum and memory potions. Seeing Cassandra's fascination with the bird, Blake managed to tame one and gifted it to her. By the time they returned to the edge of the Forbidden Forest, it was almost one o'clock in the morning. After dismounting Karina, Blake whispered a few words of gratitude to the unicorn, who then trotted away contentedly. Cassandra observed the scene in silence, her sense of wonderment growing. The night's adventures had introduced her to a world far beyond the ordinary, filled with beauty, danger, and the thrill of the unknown. It seems that the feeling of adventure is also quite exhilarating, she mused. Two days later, Blake encountered an old house elf in his dormitory. Despite being clad in a Hogwarts tea towel, Blake immediately recognized that this elf was not one of Hogwarts' own. 
The elf introduced himself as Gucci, the father of Baker, and presented Blake with a suitcase of materials, expressing joy and respect in his eyes. Thank you, Gucci, Blake responded, genuinely appreciative of the elf's efforts. Gucci's reaction was one of sheer ecstasy. Oh, the little master is so handsome, so elegant, and so humble to thank Gucci? He exclaimed, overwhelmed with emotion. Suddenly, Blake received a notification. Congratulations to the host for receiving a silver treasure chest. This unexpected reward surprised Blake. While many house elves at Hogwarts had shown appreciation for his humility, none had ever triggered such a reward. This encounter with Gucci, an elderly house elf, not only provided Blake with valuable materials, but also a unique treasure chest, highlighting the exceptional strength and character of Gucci. It could only be said that he truly lived up to being Grindelwald's most trusted house elf. It's a testament to the fact that every race has the potential to produce remarkable individuals. Blake pondered over Gucci's exceptional abilities, considering the possibility of studying the underlying reasons for his strength. If such factors could be harnessed and applied to other house elves, the idea of training a formidable army of house elves didn't seem too far-fetched. Then, hiss. No, this isn't right. Blake suddenly snapped out of his reverie, alarmed by the direction of his thoughts. His mind had veered into a dangerously ambitious territory. Why had the idea of training an army of house elves even crossed his mind? He was supposed to be one of the good guys. Oh, the young master's thoughts mirror those of the old master in his youth. Gucci exclaimed, clearly astonished. Blake was taken aback by Gucci's observation. The comparison made him reflect on his intentions and the ethical implications of his fleeting ambition. It was a moment of self-awareness, realizing the thin line between ambition and overreach, especially when it involved sentient beings like house elves. His momentary lapse into a grandiose scheme was a stark reminder of the responsibilities that came with power and the importance of wielding it wisely. Chapter 92, Nicholas Flamel's Astonishment. This child's talent surpasses mine by leaps and bounds. The morning sun bathed the room in a warm glow as it streamed through the window. Perched outside was a magnificent fiery red bird, pecking at the glass with a rhythmic tuk-tuk-tuk. It wasn't long before there was a stir inside the house. An elderly man, clad in pajamas and moving with a slight shuffle, approached the window. His face lit up with joy at the sight of the bird. Oh, dear fox, I've told you before there's no need to knock, he chuckled as he opened the window, allowing the bird to glide in gracefully. Fox, the bird, deposited two letters on the windowsill before accepting the small fish the old man offered from a nearby box. The fish disappeared in a single gulp, leaving a look of sheer bliss in Fox's eyes. However, Fox didn't immediately take off. Instead, he cocked his head, eyeing the old man as if waiting for him to read the letters and possibly carry a response back. All right, I'll read them now, the old man said, understanding Fox's silent urging. He caressed Fox's splendid feathers affectionately before turning his attention to the envelopes. One bore unfamiliar handwriting, while the other was encased in a familiar cursive script, circled elegantly. He picked up the latter and settled onto the sofa, his curiosity piqued. As he read through the letter, his expression shifted from intrigue to disbelief. The letter was from Dumbledore, introducing a young individual named Blake. Dumbledore shared that after reading his manuscript, Blake had come up with some novel ideas and sought his advice, questioning the validity of his own thoughts. Dumbledore, despite being a master alchemist, admitted to struggling with understanding Blake's concepts, a revelation that left Nicholas Flamel, for it was he, both surprised and somewhat embarrassed. Setting aside Dumbledore's letter, Nicholas turned to Blake's letter, eager to see if the claims were true. In the world of alchemy, Nicholas Flamel was a legend, his knowledge vast from centuries of study. Opening the envelope, he discovered an exquisitely crafted bracelet. Extraordinary, he murmured, examining the piece. Despite noting minor flaws in its alchemical process, he was impressed by its quality, a rarity in modern times. It was clear to him that this was not Dumbledore's work, but rather that of a new, possibly unheralded, alchemist. With the bracelet set aside, Nicholas unfolded Blake's letter. It was concise, a mark of respect to a fellow master, outlining a series of innovative ideas that had occurred to Blake 
while studying Nicholas's manuscript. Time seemed to stand still as Nicholas absorbed the contents of the letter, his initial skepticism giving way to sheer astonishment. Could it truly be that this young mind had conceived such revolutionary ideas without any guidance? It was inconceivable that Dumbledore, with no significant background in this specific field of alchemy, could have contributed. Nicholas knew Dumbledore well enough to trust in his integrity. The realization dawned on Nicholas Flamel that he was witnessing the emergence of a genuine prodigy. The ideas laid out in Blake's letter were not just novel, they were groundbreaking. For a moment, Nicholas was lost in thought, overwhelmed by the potential of what he had just read. This was not merely talent, it was genius of the highest order, challenging everything he thought he knew about the limits of alchemical knowledge. An elderly woman, also clad in loose pajamas, slowly emerged from the room. Nicole, what's going on? It's been years since I've seen you so lost in thought, she inquired. Ah, Perinelle. Nicole Flamel sighed, his gaze returning to the letter in his hands. It's because I've discovered a genius, a truly unparalleled genius. He was mesmerized by the letter's content. This child has managed to grasp new concepts in just half a month, concepts that took me years to understand, and not just superficially, but with a deep, comprehensive understanding. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to innovate in the way he has. Even I, in my youth, overlooked such novel ideas. And then there's the bracelet mentioned at the end of the letter. This is the first time I've attempted to create a bracelet using alchemy, the letter read. Below are the blueprint and materials. I hope you can offer me some advice. Nicole Flamel let out another sigh. The craftsmanship of the bracelet, comparable to that of a master alchemist, was astonishingly the work of this child, and on his first attempt, no less. And the blueprint. It was exquisitely designed. If this was indeed the child's first attempt at alchemy and at designing a blueprint, then it was a remarkable feat. Unbeknownst to Nicole, the blueprint was actually produced by a system, thus considered to be the child's own design. Nicole believed it to be the child's work, a belief reinforced by Dumbledore's account of the child acquiring an ice phoenix. The bracelet's main material, the feather of an ice phoenix, was a choice only the child could have made, given that ice phoenixes had never been seen before in the world. Isn't it wonderful to encounter a genius? And for you, Nicole, to personally praise a genius, he must be truly exceptional, Perinelle Flamel, Nicole's wife, remarked. She knew her husband well, including his pride. The last person Nicole had shown such favor towards was Albus Percival Wolfric, Brian Dumbledore, now hailed as the greatest wizard of the century. Yet, Nicole's reaction to this new prodigy seemed even more profound than his initial impression of young Dumbledore, suggesting this new genius possessed even greater talent. However, Nicole's expression was not one of pure joy. It's indeed a cause for happiness, but I'm also incredulous. Did you know, did you know that this child was brought from the muggle world by Albus just two months ago? He's been exposed to alchemy for less than three months, yet I feel his achievements have already surpassed mine at the age of 30. Perinelle looked at her husband in astonishment, wondering if age had muddled his judgment. To suggest that a child, within three months, had exceeded the accomplishments of Nicole Flamel at 30 was unthinkable. After all, Nicole's exceptional talent had led him to create the Philosopher's Stone, extending his life far beyond its natural span. If you're so puzzled, why not ask Albus directly? Perinelle suggested. You always have a point, Perinelle. But could you stay a bit longer? Nicole stood up abruptly, not bothering to write back. Instead, he retrieved a book from a cabinet. Are you planning to use this to contact Albus? Yes, I can't wait any longer. I have questions that need to be asked in person. Even with a phoenix to deliver letters, it's too slow for me now, Nicole explained as he opened the book. Each page of the book contained a portrait, a magical means of communication far quicker than any letter. Nicholas Flamel turned to the page featuring Dumbledore in the magical communication book. Upon seeing Nicholas, a flicker of surprise crossed Dumbledore's eyes. Nicholas addressed the portrait directly. I need to see Albus now. Dumbledore's portrait in the book nodded before fading away, only to reappear shortly after, this time not as a mere portrait, but as a living presence in the headmaster's office at Hogwarts. 
Dumbledore, holding a thick tome, faced Nicholas's image in the book with a wry smile. Nicholas, it's been ages since you've used this method to contact me. This communication book, a relic from the time when Grindelwald terrorized Europe, was used by those in secret resistance against him. Since Grindelwald's imprisonment in Nurmengard, the book had lain dormant. Dumbledore realized that Nicholas's sudden use of it must signify something of great importance. What's so urgent that you couldn't wait for Fox to deliver your message? Dumbledore asked, his expression turning grave as he braced for potentially world-shattering news. Nicholas, however, quickly eased Dumbledore's concern. It's not as dire as you both think. I wanted to discuss the young man, Blake, with you. Dumbledore's tension dissipated. Ah, if it's about Blake, then the matter might not be as catastrophic as I feared. He recalled sending a letter to Nicholas a few days prior, but knew well the challenges of reaching the alchemist. Nicholas's penchant for seclusion and the magical concealment of his whereabouts made him difficult to locate, even for Dumbledore's phoenix, Fox. Is this about Blake's letter? Dumbledore inquired, wondering if Blake had penned something offensive or alarming. You underestimate me, Albus. Would I really resort to this method over a few harsh words? Nicholas chided gently. Dumbledore apologized, realizing his mistake stemmed from his deep concern for Blake. He is indeed very important to me, Dumbledore admitted, eager to understand Nicholas's perspective. After a brief pause, Nicholas broached the subject of Blake's potential in alchemy. Dumbledore praised Blake's aptitude and quick learning, admitting that even in his youth, he couldn't match Blake's pace. Nicholas, with a hint of amusement and pride, declared, That boy is a genius, Albus, a true genius, and one who surpasses me by a hundredfold. Dumbledore was taken aback by Nicholas's admission. To hear such high praise from Nicholas Flamel himself was extraordinary. The acknowledgement that Blake's talent in alchemy exceeded even that of Flamel, a renowned master of the art, was astounding. How can that be? Dumbledore exclaimed, struggling to grasp the magnitude of Nicholas's statement. Nicholas reminded Dumbledore of their previous conversation about Blake's recent introduction to alchemy and his rapid progress. It was clear that Blake's natural talent and potential were beyond what either of them had initially imagined. Dumbledore's expression remained one of shock, a testament to the revelation he had just encountered. Two months ago, I introduced him to some alchemy texts, Nicholas Flamel sighed, the weight of his words hanging in the air. So, Albus, he has been immersed in the world of alchemy for less than three months. The astonishment in his voice was palpable as he continued, yet his accomplishments now surpass those I had achieved by the age of thirty. And to think... By that time, I had dedicated fifteen years of my life to the study of alchemy. He paused, a mixture of incredulity and admiration coloring his tone. Do you suppose his talent far exceeds my own? Meanwhile, at Hogwarts, in the midst of a defense against the dark arts class, Blake found himself equally astounded. Before him, within the confines of the system's space, two supreme treasure chests had materialized out of nowhere. It appears that Nick Flamel has received my letter he mused, a sense of wonder and anticipation washing over him. The implications of these developments were profound. Here was a student, Blake, whose prowess in alchemy had caught the attention of none other than Nicholas Flamel, a legend in his own right. And there, in the hallowed halls of Hogwarts, Dumbledore and Flamel pondered the potential of a talent that seemed to defy the very limits they had come to accept. The unfolding events promised to challenge their understanding of magic and mastery, setting the stage for a journey that would unravel in the most unexpected of ways. Chapter 93 The Innocence of Complexity So this child is essentially a creation born from the fusion of wizarding alchemy and muggle science? Nico Flamel pondered aloud after Dumbledore shared the astonishing news. Silence enveloped him as he grappled with the concept. As an esteemed alchemist who had lived for over six centuries, Flamel had indeed entertained the notion of using alchemy to create life. However, he ultimately abandoned this daunting idea, deeming it unethical and a violation of natural laws. In his expertise, crafting a human form through alchemy was feasible, yet the true challenge lay in the essence of life itself. Such a creation, he feared, would lack a soul, rendering it nothing more than a sophisticated mannequin. Wizards, 
aware of their own souls and the existence of ghosts within Hogwarts, would understand this distinction. However, Dumbledore's revelation that Grindelwald had succeeded in this endeavor decades ago took Flamel by surprise. The experiment, long thought to have failed, had indeed yielded a living being with a soul, Blake. Dumbledore, are you certain this child is free from corruption? Flamel inquired with gravity, addressing Dumbledore formally. Dumbledore responded with confidence. He's a good boy. I vouch for him and promise to guide him away from any path that might lead him astray. Flamel, reassured by Dumbledore's commitment, eventually conceded, acknowledging the unpredictable nature of alchemy. All right, Albus, inform the boy that he has my approval. The manuscript I sent is my gift to him, and he is welcome to explore my library. I'll have Fox deliver my letter to him, and should he seek knowledge, he can reach me directly via Phoenix. Meanwhile, Blake found himself under the tutelage of Quirrell, who was possessed by Voldemort, in a defense against the dark arts class. Despite the bizarre circumstances, Voldemort, through Quirrell, was imparting genuine combat techniques, much to Blake's bewilderment. It seemed as though Voldemort was preparing him for something greater, or perhaps compensating for his own unfulfilled desires to teach the subject. After the class, the students now buzzing with excitement and newfound respect bid Professor Quirrell a polite farewell a stark contrast to their demeanor just weeks prior. This chapter delves into the ethical boundaries of magical innovation, the unexpected mentorship of an adversary, and the complexities hidden within seemingly straightforward intentions. Through the interactions between Dumbledore, Flamel, and Blake, it explores themes of trust, redemption, and the pursuit of knowledge, all while hinting at the deeper machinations at play within the wizarding world. The transformation of Professor Quirrell from his former self was notable, with many attributing the change to an incident involving Blake's illuminating spell. This event, seen by some as a fortunate accident, seemingly cured Quirrell of his previous ailments, allowing him to teach more effectively. While this improvement was welcomed by most, Blake felt a sense of unease, uncertain of Quirrell's true intentions. As Blake and Hermione prepared to leave the classroom, Quirrell's voice halted Blake's departure. Hermione, unaware of the significance, bid Blake farewell and left, considering such requests from Quirrell to be routine. After all, it was well known that Blake was Quirrell's favored student, a fact that always sent a shiver down Blake's spine. He wished his emotional turmoil could somehow unlock a treasure chest of rewards. Attempting to mask his apprehension, Blake faced Quirrell with feigned admiration and asked, Professor, what do you need me to do? Quirrell inquired if Blake was aware of the school clubs, to which Blake admitted his limited knowledge. Despite the numerous student societies at Hogwarts, they were seldom mentioned in the original narrative, leaving Blake somewhat in the dark. Quirrell suggested Blake join a club to further develop his talents, praising his exceptional abilities. He then revealed his intention to establish a new club with Blake as its chairman. Handing Blake a piece of parchment, Quirrell announced the formation of a duel club, leaving Blake astonished and questioning the implications of this proposal. Despite his reservations, Blake accepted the role, recognizing the potential benefits for his fellow students, albeit wary of Quirrell's underlying motives. He resolved to inform Dumbledore of this development, given Quirrell's increasingly peculiar behavior. Upon reaching Dumbledore's office, Blake was greeted with unexpected news. Dumbledore shared that an old friend had received Blake's letter and, impressed by his innovative ideas, had passed a manuscript to Blake as a gift. This revelation added another layer of intrigue to Blake's already complex situation at Hogwarts. Dumbledore handed Blake an envelope and a suitcase with a smile. This is a part of the collection he selected for you. You can ask him for it after you finish reading. Blake, puzzled, asked, couldn't it be under an untraceable stretching charm? How did you know? Dumbledore was surprised. I guessed, Blake replied nonchalantly, though he couldn't very well admit he had received similar enchanted boxes before. Curious, Blake ventured. May I ask the name of your old friend? Now, I can tell you, my boy. Have you ever heard of the legendary alchemist? Dumbledore's eyes twinkled. Nicholas Flamel. Blake exclaimed with feigned astonishment recognizing the name from his chocolate frog card. 
the very same Nicholas? Yes, that's him. You might not be familiar with him since you're new to the wizarding world, but there are few in our world who haven't heard of this great alchemist, Dumbledore explained, his voice filled with admiration. Blake felt honored as they continued to discuss Nicholas Flamel. Suddenly, Dumbledore shifted the conversation. What did you want to discuss with me today? Oh, I almost forgot. Blake quickly retrieved the parchment Quirrell had given him and handed it to Dumbledore. Quirrell asked me to start a club and recruit students to join. I agreed initially to avoid raising any suspicions, but if you think it's inappropriate, we can always reject the idea. That way, Quirrell won't suspect anything. Dumbledore, aware of Blake's need to maintain his disguise in front of Quirrell, nodded in understanding. You're handling the situation well, Blake. If you had refused Quirrell outright, he would have grown suspicious. It's wise not to startle the snake prematurely. So, what should I do? Blake asked, genuinely unsure. Do you want to help him? Dumbledore asked, a mischievous glint in his eye. Blake nodded, intrigued. Dumbledore leaned in. The task I have for you is to establish this club as Quirrell has requested, and then make it thrive. Blake stared at Dumbledore, his blue eyes wide with disbelief. If the man before him wasn't Voldemort in disguise, then Dumbledore must have lost his mind. However, Blake knew better. Neither Voldemort nor Dumbledore were mad. They each had their intricate plans and strategies. Sitting in front of the Room of Requirement, Blake muttered to himself, These schemers, always plotting. They're nothing like me, so straightforward and honest. He set aside the bookcase and Nicholas Flamel's reply, then eagerly opened his system space. Without hesitation, he took out a vial of Felix Felicis, the lucky potion, and took a drop. Nothing is more important than opening treasure chests, Blake declared, especially with two supreme chests waiting in his system space. System, open two supreme treasure chests for me, he commanded. Ding, opening supreme treasure chest for the host, the system announced. Ding, congratulations to the host for obtaining the magical Gubraithian fire. Ding, opening another supreme treasure chest for the host. Ding, Congratulations to the host for obtaining a blueprint for the Eye of Agamotto. Blake's eyes sparkled with excitement. The Gubraithian fire, known as the Eternal Flame, was an advanced form of fire magic that never extinguishes. Only a select few wizards could wield such powerful magic, Dumbledore being one of them. It was rumored that the fire Dumbledore used to fend off in fairy in the cave with Harry in the original story was this ancient flame. Holding out his left hand, Blake summoned a hovering red flame above it, feeling its intense heat. Blake's eyes sparkled with excitement as he held the Gublai immortal fire in his hands. Its astonishing attack power, combined with his own Gandalf-inspired prowess, meant that his fire attribute spell damage would see an epic increase. Hmm, is it possible that fire magic is more suited to me? He pondered aloud. I should seek out Grindelwald one of these days and learn his gas stove technique. With that, Blake carefully stored the Gublai Immortal Fire and turned his attention to the second reward, the Eye of Agamotto. However, Blake was uncertain whether this was the Eye of Agamotto as depicted in the comics or in the movies. If it was the latter, it would mean possessing the Time Stone itself, granting him the ability to travel through time at will. The very thought filled him with exhilaration. Eagerly, he examined its blueprint, but ten seconds later, his excitement waned. Excuse me. Despite the boost from the lucky potion and his alchemy skills, which were nearing an intermediate level, he realized he could only comprehend a mere tenth of the blueprint's intricacies. Blake clenched his fists in determination. If this was the case, then it was imperative that Nicole Flamel could not die. His journey was just beginning, and the mysteries of the Eye of Agamotto and the Gublai Immortal Fire promised a path filled with adventure and discovery. With a renewed sense of purpose, Blake set his sights on mastering these powerful artifacts, unaware of the challenges and revelations that lay ahead. Chapter 94 The Infinite Energy of Gublai Immortal Fire Nicholas's Dilemma in the Room of Requirement, amidst the Fantastic Beasts section, a young girl tilted her head, observing Blake with curiosity. At that moment, Blake was holding a large bag of ground turtles, preparing to feed the bow truckles that resided in a holly tree he had transplanted into the room. The young girl, intrigued by the green creatures, 
had initially wanted to taste them, wondering if they might crunch like chicken. However, Blake had promptly dissuaded her from the idea. Instead, Blake offered, Would you like some fish? The young girl nodded eagerly. Her interest in the bow truckles was more about trying something new rather than actual hunger. For her, the succulent salmon that Blake had in his system warehouse, originally intended for bears, was far more appealing. As Blake glanced around the room of requirement, he noted the limited number of magical creatures present. He mused about the need to create more poke balls to capture and bring back additional fantastic beasts, envisioning a more vibrant atmosphere. Then, taking out a holly branch given to him by a bow truckle, Blake planted it in the ground and snapped his fingers. A mass of crimson flames, the Goublet Immortal Fire, hovered above the branch. Unlike the destructive Fiendfire curse, Blake controlled the Goublet Immortal Fire with precision, ensuring it did not harm the holly branch below. This flame, known for its eternal nature, offered unparalleled utility beyond mere destruction, especially for alchemists. Alchemy required a consistent and powerful source of heat, and the Goublet Immortal Fire, with its temperature rivaling that of the Fiendfire Curse, could purify materials to a much higher quality. Its ability to melt alchemy-specific metals, which ordinary flames could not, was a significant advantage. However, the most remarkable aspect of the Goublet Immortal Fire was its potential to provide infinite energy, a feature that made it truly worthy of being considered a supreme treasure. Lost in thoughts about the future applications of the Goublet Immortal Fire, including powering alchemy puppets indefinitely, Blake was startled when the young girl, an ice phoenix in disguise, suddenly consumed the flame in one gulp. Ah? Blake stared at her, bewildered. Where did my fire go? How could such a powerful flame just disappear? Chirp! Ch chirp! Eat! Delicious! Is there any more? The young girl looked at Blake, sparks still flickering on her beak. No, but you're a frost phoenix. Shouldn't you be afraid of fire? Blake asked, puzzled. Chirp, chirp, chirp. Phoenix is afraid of fire? Are you sure? She responded, equally baffled. But this is the Gublai immortal flame. It's not ordinary fire, Blake protested. Chirp, chirp, chirp. Is this supposed to be hot? She questioned, unimpressed. Blake sighed, realizing that to a creature like her, even the formidable Gublai immortal fire was just another flame. Indeed, no matter its power, to you it's still just fire. Chirp, 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 exactly. Phoenixes are not afraid of fire, she chirped happily, settling the matter. Blake, scratching his head, confidently stated, Yes, as long as I have sufficient physical strength and magical power, I can produce endless fire. With a snap of his fingers, a cluster of Gublai fairy fire reappeared on the holly tree branch. Gulu, the frost phoenix, chirped inquisitively, as if asking for more. Observing the Gublai fairy fire vanish swiftly, Blake mused, This fire is unquenchable, can you truly digest it? He reached out to touch the frost phoenix's belly, which was ice cold. The phoenix pecked at him in response. Hey, did you just peck me? Blake exclaimed. Chirp, no touching there, the phoenix retorted. Meanwhile, a conversation unfolded elsewhere. They're dreadful, one voice said. I actually think it's a fitting punishment for their breach of school rules, another countered. There's no need to be so upset with them. They're just two foolish kids, third voice added. The door to the room of requirement swung open, revealing Cassandra and an exasperated Hermione. After a harrowing night in the Forbidden Forest, Cassandra's mental state had remarkably stabilized. Having survived such terror, she wondered what else could possibly unsettle her now. Yet there was indeed someone who could. Blake. At that moment, Blake was attempting to place a letter into the beak of the young phoenix. You can find him, right? He asked. The phoenix, brimming with pride, transformed into a faint blue light and vanished the next second. Huh? Blake, why are there red feathers on the young phoenix's wings? They weren't there yesterday, Cassandra observed, puzzled. The phoenix, predominantly blue, now sported a few dazzling red feathers at the tips of its wings. I fed her some fire, and she changed a bit, Blake explained. The ancient eternal fire he referred to was not meant to be extinguished. Thus, even after the phoenix ingested it, it could only assimilate it gradually. Blake noticed several changes. The appearance of red feathers, the addition of Gublai immortal fire to her skill set, and an increase in her attribute points and magical power. 
This unexpected development indicated that the Gublai immortal fire had a fortifying effect on her body, much to Blake's surprise. Feed her fire? Cassandra and Hermione looked at Blake as if he were mistreating a pet. Blake, feeling misunderstood, clarified, It's not that I wanted to experiment. She eagerly consumed my alchemy fire and then inquired if there was more. She's an ice phoenix. Can she really consume fire? Cassandra questioned. Blake replied with pride. What are you talking about? She's a phoenix. Since when are phoenixes afraid of fire? Changing the subject, Blake took out some ground turtles and fed them to the soundless bird perched on Cassandra's shoulder. He then casually asked Hermione, Why were you so angry earlier? It's because of Harry Potter and Ronald Weasley, Hermione exclaimed. Harry blatantly broke the school rules, and though it turned out to be a blessing in disguise, with him being selected for the Quidditch team and receiving a broom from Professor McGonagall, the fact remains that they initially aired and broke the rules, yet they were proud of it. I couldn't help but reprimand them. But they, they said I have no other friends, Hermione fumed. Blake sighed. Oh, you've forgotten what I told you again. Once you start lecturing, it's true that few classmates will want to befriend you. That's impossible. Then why did you befriend me? Don't you dislike my lecturing? Hermione challenged. Blake replied with a hint of sarcasm. Hey, hey, that's because you have nothing to lecture me about. Indeed, Hermione had nothing to teach Blake that he didn't already know or couldn't do better. Although Hermione had initially brought up the topic of school rule violations, she found herself at a loss for words when facing Blake. Despite his embarrassing situation, Blake quickly shifted the conversation away from his misdeeds, much to Hermione's chagrin, who still harbored the urge to punch him for his antics. Blake, satisfied with acquiring a silver treasure chest, steered the conversation towards Harry's new broom, a Nimbus 2000, a detail that made him ponder why he hadn't received a broom himself. Dumbledore had yet to fulfill this promise, leaving Blake to compensate the school for every broom he used during practice, under Captain Marcus's insistence that it was necessary for his training. However, upon learning that Marcus crafted brooms at home, Blake's guilt vanished, understanding Marcus's motives and thanking him for the brooms with increased fervor in his practice sessions. Blake's attention then turned to a letter from Nicholas Flamel, which he had read numerous times, marveling at Flamel's alchemical prowess. Flamel's ability to enhance a simple bracelet without adding new ingredients, turning it into a crystal bracelet plus two, left Blake in awe and deep contemplation about how to conv ins Flamel to continue his work with the Philosopher's Stone, hoping to extend his life and further Blake's own alchemical skills. Blake considered getting involved in the plot to secure the Philosopher's Stone himself, but he knew Flamel might not accept it and could potentially report him to Dumbledore. He questioned Dumbledore's decision to destroy the stone, suggesting a ruse to deceive Voldemort instead, preserving Flamel's life. Blake reflected on Flamel's possible desire for death after living for over 600 years, having experienced all that life had to offer and reaching the pinnacle of alchemy. He speculated that for Flamel, death might be a welcome rest. However, Blake saw an opportunity to rekindle Flamel's interest in life by presenting him with new challenges. He drafted a blueprint for a Pokeball, a concept he hoped would intrigue Flamel, and penned a letter expressing his desire for guidance and sharing his new idea. By proposing this new project to Flamel, Blake aimed to provide the alchemist with fresh goals and reasons to continue living effectively engaging Flamel's expertise and curiosity in a manner that could potentially alter both their destinies. Blake was deeply engrossed in thoughts about alchemy, convinced that Nicholas Flamel, with his insatiable curiosity for the art, would be unable to resist delving into the research of any blueprint he received, especially one as complex as this. However, Blake also knew that such a sophisticated blueprint couldn't be fully deciphered in a casual manner. This meant that Nicholas Flamel was likely to remain preoccupied with it for some time, postponing any thoughts of mortality. Blake had already planned his next move. If Nicholas Flamel eventually concluded that the blueprint was unfeasible, Blake would send a more detailed version, claiming it was his latest innovation. He was confident that this would rekindle Flamel's interest, 
allowing Blake to, metaphorically speaking, farm more treasures from him. The thought of the blueprint had been a lingering puzzle in Blake's mind, one he couldn't solve. Yet, he was able to conceive further developments, a fact that would surely impress Flamel and perhaps even earn Blake a treasure chest in gratitude. Blake felt as though Flamel had unlocked a new realm of possibilities for him. He was certain that Flamel wasn't ready to face death just yet. And even if Flamel managed to fully decipher the blueprint of the Pokeball on his own, Blake had another ace up his sleeve, the blueprint for the Eye of Agamotto, specifically its core refinement process, a section so complex that Blake himself couldn't comprehend it. He pondered how much of it Flamel would be able to understand. If Flamel found it incomprehensible, it would suggest that there were even greater depths to alchemy yet to be explored. Blake wasn't entirely sure if this core part involved the time stone, but he considered the possibility unlikely. If questioned about the origin of the blueprint, Blake planned to say he discovered it in the Room of Requirement. The room was known to house a vast collection of discarded items, mountains of what many would consider rubbish. Despite a significant portion being consumed by his levitation cloak, the remaining debris was still substantial. It wouldn't be far-fetched, then, for Blake to have stumbled upon such an unusual blueprint among the myriad of discarded items, right? Chapter 95 The Dilemma of Being Surrounded by Dark Lords Blake didn't have to wait long before the young girl returned with a response. According to Chingnamf, Nicole May had changed locations again. Blake was momentarily speechless. Having a lot of real estate certainly gives you the freedom to move around as you please, he thought. Fortunately, Chingnam's tracking skills proved to be superior to Fox's. Despite Nicole May's relocation, she managed to quickly find him, delivering Blake's letter of gratitude along with new inquiries. The young girl also brought back a reply from Nico Flamel to Blake's latest question. Without giving the young girl a chance to rest, Blake handed her another large envelope. I appreciate your hard work. Please take this, he said. Ching rolled her eyes, feeling slightly aggrieved that she had just returned and hadn't even had the chance to eat a single fish before being tasked with another errand. Nevertheless, she accepted the letter. Having just returned from Nico Flamel's, she didn't need to search for his location again and left Hogwarts directly via apparition. Watching the spot where the young girl vanished, Blake stroked his chin thoughtfully. This should keep Nicholas May occupied for a while, he mused. Opening Nico Flamel's reply, Blake felt a surge of excitement at the prospect of delving deeper into the world of alchemy. Blake held the parchment, pondering his next steps. Forming a new society at Hogwarts required approval from a corresponding supervisor and, crucially, Dumbledore's permission. With these prerequisites met, students could proceed with the official formalities. The final step involved advertising on the bulletin board to recruit members. Blake realized that he would be the one running these errands, caught in the schemes of both Voldemort and Dumbledore. He couldn't help but suspect that Dumbledore, ensuring his involvement, might be playing a deeper game, possibly even colluding with Voldemort. Quirrell mentioned it was at the end of the corridor on the third floor, didn't he? But there's nothing there. Blake muttered to himself, regretting not asking Cedric for help earlier. Well, it's not surprising for Hogwarts to have a secret door or two. Drawing his wand, Blake prepared to use an exploration spell he had learned from Grindelwald. As he probed the walls, the seemingly solid barrier at the end of the corridor parted like a pair of doors, revealing a hidden passage. A beautiful girl with curly hair emerged, a look of frustration on her face. Good day, Pinello senpai Blake greeted her warmly. Pinello looked up, her spirits lifting slightly upon seeing Blake. Hello, Blake. What brings you here? You seem troubled, she inquired, noticing his curious gaze. It's nothing major, just some issues with a club, Pinello replied, trying to dismiss her concerns. Club? Blake's interest was piqued. Although he had been tasked by Quirrell to handle some club-related matters, and Dumbledore had somehow coerced him into agreeing, he was still in the dark about the specifics, including where to officially register the club. Now, with Pinello, an acquaintance well-versed in these matters, standing before him, Blake saw an opportunity to gather the information he needed. Perfect, 
Pinello Senpai, I was actually looking to inquire about clubs, Blake said, seizing the moment. Pinello's demeanor brightened at Blake's interest. You're interested in joining a club? I'd recommend the Charms Club. It's usually by invitation from Professor Flitwick, but I'm sure he'd make an exception for you. He often mentions you during our sessions, she explained, her enthusiasm evident. Blake was taken aback by Pinello's eagerness, especially as she enthusiastically linked arms with him, ready to guide him towards the Charms Club. In the Charms Club, Blake spoke with a hint of caution. It's not a good idea. He felt the gentle pressure in his arms and sighed internally. This development is really something, he thought, but then he caught himself. No. Focus, Black. E. Remember your goals. Why not? The Charms Club is fascinating, Pinello, the senior member, inquired with a hint of disappointment. I'm sorry, Pinello Senpai, Blake replied. I don't plan to join any other clubs for the time being, because I might not have the energy to participate in other club activities soon. Blake had a strong belief in the dueling club's potential. It wasn't just about his reputation drawing people in. The dueling club itself was inherently appealing. After all, when Lockhart announced the formation of the dueling club in the original story, nearly every young wizard in the school rushed to sign up, eager for the thrill of dueling. Moreover, with the recent buzz around Quarrel, Blake was confident that announcing his own dueling club would attract a significant number of students. As the club's president, he anticipated being too occupied to even consider joining another club. Driven by a mix of ambition and personal interest, Blake had even requested a week off from Quidditch practice to focus on this new endeavor. Marcus, upon hearing the news, had celebrated by drinking an extra glass of pumpkin juice at dinner, joking about the exciting times ahead. What are you planning to do next? Pinello asked, her curiosity piqued. I'm starting a club. I've got permission from a professor and from Professor Dumbledore himself, Blake shared, his excitement barely contained. Really? That's wonderful. Hogwarts hasn't seen a new club in ages, Pinello exclaimed, her excitement evident. She reminded him that students could join multiple clubs as long as the schedules didn't conflict. What club are you creating? And who's the advisor? She inquired further. The club I'm forming is the Dueling Club, with Professor Quirrell as the advisor. He's asked me to be the president of this new club, Blake explained. Pinello's reaction was a mix of surprise and admiration. No wonder people say you're Quirrell's favorite student. This comment made Blake's skin crawl as it reminded him of an unsettling comparison to Voldemort, a favorite student of a Dark Lord. I'm definitely on the side of good, so why do my mentors have to be so controversial? He thought, recalling the dark pasts of both Dumbledore and Voldemort. I'm new here and could use some guidance. Could you help me? Blake asked, hoping to leverage Pinello's experience. Of course, Blake. A dueling club sounds amazing. And when you start, you must invite Professor Flitwick as a guest. He was a dueling champion in his youth. Pinello's enthusiasm was infectious. With Pinello's help, the process became much smoother. They first located the student union, then met with its chairman to review the professor's files and register the new club. They also secured permission to use the school bulletin board for announcements, a privilege not extended to ordinary students without approval. Finally, they applied for a venue for the club's activities. Each club had its own space, though some, like the Charms Club, only required a classroom due to its focus on spell work and not needing much space. Blake was determined to find the perfect venue for the dueling club, envisioning a place where students could safely engage in the art of dueling, learning both the theory and practice under his and Professor Quirrell's guidance. The need for a larger venue was apparent, but the best option available seemed to be a large classroom, sufficient for members to engage in gobstones. However, Blake, considering the actual requirements, decided to apply for not one but two large classrooms for the dueling club. Pinello, a senior member, had suggested a large classroom as it would accommodate many people for dueling practice. Blake, after a moment of contemplation, shared his ambitious plan. The head of the student council, a tall boy from Slytherin, scrutinized Blake for a long moment before cautioning him about the potential of losing the venue if it proved too large for the club's actual size. 
This rule was in place to prevent the wastage of public resource as considering the limited number of classrooms available for club activities. Blake acknowledged the rule, understanding its necessity, yet he harbored concerns that even two classrooms might not suffice. He envisioned the auditorium as the ideal location, anticipating a large turnout for the club. Despite the student body president's skepticism, he did not obstruct Blake's request. He reasoned that if the club failed to attract a sufficient number of members, the venue could simply be reassigned. Blake spent a busy afternoon securing the venue, all the while keeping in mind his broader strategies involving figures like Voldemort and Dumbledore. Pinello, who had been by Blake's side throughout the process, eagerly inquired about the club's registration. Blake seized the moment to invite her to join as the first member and even offered her the position of vice chairperson. Pinello was taken aback by the offer, especially since she had recently faced disappointment in the Charms Club election. Despite her loss, Blake's offer presented a new opportunity, and his praise of her qualities, beauty, generosity, kindness, and bravery, only solidified his choice. Blake's proposal was met with hesitation from Pinello, but she ultimately accepted, excited about the prospect of joining the dueling club and taking on a leadership role. This development pleased Blake immensely, as it meant he would have support in managing the club's affairs. Establishing the club was initially a strategy to divert suspicion from Professor Quirrell and to uncover his intentions, but it had quickly become a venture with its own set of challenges. With Pinello's acceptance, Blake felt a weight lifted, grateful for the assistance in navigating the complexities of running the club. Pinello looked around, her mind racing with possibilities. The realization that she only needed to play her part in the future filled her with excitement. Okay, let's work together, senior sister, she exclaimed with enthusiasm. You go and post the announcement on the bulletin board and then distribute the leaflets, Pinello was instructed. I, I'll go directly to recruit members, she quickly agreed, understanding the weight of Blake's popularity. She knew that with Blake announcing the establishment of a new club, support would flood in. The incident involving Snape had already earned Blake the gratitude of many young wizards. They would show up in support of Blake's endeavors, even if just out of loyalty. And this wasn't just any club. It was a dueling club. Pinello sensed that this club was destined for greatness, which is why Blake had secured two large classrooms. She had no objections whatsoever. With a stack of leaflets in hand, Senior Sister Pinello departed, leaving Blake to embark on his first recruitment mission to the Hufflepuff Common Room. Upon entering, Blake was greeted by the sight of numerous young wizards scattered around the room. Wasting no time, he raised his hand high and called out, Attention, everyone! Attention! All eyes on me! I have an important announcement to make. After a brief cough to clear his throat, he continued with renewed vigor, I've created a new dueling club. Blake's announcement echoed through the common room, capturing the attention of every wizard present. His confidence and the intriguing prospect of a dueling club sparked an immediate interest among the students. Chapter 96. I am Voldemort's favorite student? The announcement of the dueling club immediately captivated the young wizards in the common room, their excitement palpable as they crowded around for more details. Dueling club? Is that for real? one asked, eyes wide with anticipation. Absolutely, Blake responded with infectious enthusiasm. In the dueling club, Professor Quirrell will teach us the art of combat, focusing on various fighting techniques. Plus, you'll have the opportunity to practice during club meetings. As the buzz of excitement grew, Blake noticed Cedric peering outside. Without hesitation, he dashed out and returned, dragging the handsome senior back into the fray. You're joining us, right? Blake asked, his enthusiasm catching Cedric off guard. Um, well, if it doesn't conflict with Quidditch practice, Marcus might not be too keen on letting people skip, Cedric hesitated. Marcus? Ask him if he knows the Iron Armor curse, Blake challenged. No, I mean, he should, but then he must join too. He's graduating soon and doesn't know the Iron Armor curse. It's dangerous out there, Cedric. Do you really want to attend his next match with a bouquet of white flowers? Blake, are you cursing me? Marcus stormed in, overhearing the conversation. He was brandishing his broom, a look of indignation on his face. 
Marcus, isn't that your beloved broom, the one you supposedly sleep with? Blake teased, dodging Marcus's attempts to hit him with the broom. Rubbish. Who said I sleep with my broom? Marcus retorted, his face turning a shade of red. Caught you blushing, Marcus. Can't handle a bit of teasing? Blake taunted, earning a mix of laughter and gasps from the surrounding crowd. Blake, you're dead, Marcus threatened, but his attempt to retaliate was futile. In a surprising turn of events, it was Marcus who ended up on the ground, showcasing Blake's superior dueling skills. See? This is why you need to join the dueling club. With proper training, you too can have skills like these, Blake boasted, earning applause from the onlookers. Cedric, impressed, gave Blake a thumbs up. You truly are Professor Quirrell's favorite student. Even a seventh year like Marcus couldn't best you. Blake's smile vanished, replaced by a shiver of discomfort. Cedric, let's not mention that again, okay? Despite the awkward moment, Blake's demonstration had its intended effect. Applications for the dueling club flooded in, leaving Blake with the tedious task of sorting through them. As chairman, he had no intention of handling the paperwork himself. However, realizing he lacked a team to delegate to, he reluctantly enlisted Cedric's help, promising that all Hufflepuff applications would be his responsibility. I need to promote the club to the other houses, Cedric. As chairman, my duties are endless, Blake explained, leaving Cedric to grumble about the unfair distribution of work. As Blake ventured out to spread the word, he encountered Cassandra and briefed her on the dueling club, hoping she would help promote it within Slytherin. Despite the house's apparent animosity, Blake knew the importance of inclusivity. After all, every student deserved the chance to defend themselves, regardless of house allegiance. Blake decided to delegate the responsibility of spreading the word about the dueling club to Cassandra for Gryffindor. He believed that Gryffindors, with their inherent bravery, would eagerly embrace the opportunity to learn combat skills. Blake also entrusted Hermione with the task hoping it would serve as a chance for her to engage more with her peers. He was concerned that without making an effort to connect, Hermione might find herself isolated in the future. However, he cautioned her against letting her tendency to lecture take over. As the chairman, Blake had efficiently distributed the workload among others and made his way back to the room of requirement to focus on his own matters. The dueling club had indeed sparked interest among many young wizards, and word of mouth was all it took to get students to sign up. Blake was confident that the student union would handle the influx of applications without needing his intervention. In the evening, the president of the student union, a tall Slytherin boy, was taken aback by the mountain of registration forms presented by Pinello. The sheer volume of interest in the dueling club was unexpected, and the sight of the forms caused a stir among the student union members. They were overwhelmed by the prospect of processing such a large number of applications, a task they hadn't anticipated being so demanding. Pinello then revealed that the pile he brought in was only from Ravenclaw, implying that there were even more applications from the other houses. This revelation was met with disbelief and a sense of dread among the union members, including the president, who realized the workload might require his direct involvement. The situation escalated when Harry, Ronald, and Hermione arrived, each carrying their own stacks of registration forms from Gryffindor, followed by Cassandra, Goyle, and Crabbe with forms from Slytherin, and finally Cedric, who brought in Hufflepuff's applications. The student union was astounded by the overwhelming interest from the entire school. At dinner, Blake was pleased to overhear conversations about the dueling club, indicating its popularity. However, he was momentarily puzzled by the absence of his dessert, only to discover Cedric, with cake crumbs at the corner of his mouth, trying to suppress a laugh. Blake, realizing the playful theft, responded with a light-hearted gesture, tapping the table with his fingers, signaling the start of a friendly banter. In the next moment, an array of desserts materialized in front of him once again. Cedric's expression soured instantly. Unbelievable! Why do the house elves favor you so much? he exclaimed. Meanwhile, at the faculty table, Dumbledore observed the lively discussions among the young wizards about the dueling club with a content smile. That young man Blake has managed to organize it so swiftly. Impressive, he thought to himself. Quirrell, on the other hand, 
seemed almost invisible, blending into the background with his usual timidity. Snape, who usually preferred the solitude of his own company, made a rare appearance in the auditorium that day. However, he chose to sit beside Dumbledore. What are your thoughts on this dueling club? He inquired, his voice barely above a whisper. I believe it's a fine initiative. Dumbledore responded, pausing to sip his sweet honey water. That club was Quirrell's idea. I'm certain he harbors ill intentions, Snape interjected, his words laced with suspicion. Dumbledore replied softly, If I thought his intentions were purely malicious, I wouldn't have endorsed the club so readily. This took Snape by surprise. You have an ulterior motive? But why place Blake directly under Quirrell's scrutiny? He asked, his tone dripping with sarcasm. I have faith in the boy, Severus. Those who underestimate him are bound to be caught off guard, Dumbledore stated, his voice firm yet gentle. Snape's expression turned stony, signaling the end of their conversation. Back in the auditorium, amidst the ongoing discussions about the dueling club, Blake was preoccupied with the desserts before him. Suddenly, a faint blue light illuminated the area, and a magnificent bird appeared before Blake. Its long tail feathers inadvertently swept Blake's pudding onto the floor. The assembly of young wizards gasped in awe, having never witnessed such a splendid creature. That's Blake's phoenix, someone shouted, causing a stir throughout the auditorium. Rumors of Blake possessing a phoenix had circulated before, but few had seen it with their own eyes, and Blake had never confirmed it. Now, with the phoenix's majestic appearance and magical aura, there was no room for doubt. Blake, however, seemed unfazed by the commotion. He didn't even glance at the system notifications about the treasure chest. After feeding the phoenix a few pieces of cake, his dac attention shifted to a long parcel left on the table, accompanied by a note. Heard you're heading to a Quidditch match but lack a broom? Here's a gift from me. Also, the blueprint you sent was fascinating. Cedric, eyeing the package, exclaimed, Is that a broom, Blake? You finally have your own broom. Marcus will be thrilled. Marcus, patting Cedric on the head, added, I'm quite pleased myself. He then jokingly lamented the future loss of his pocket money now that Blake wouldn't need to borrow brooms. After the phoenix had its fill of cake and grew uncomfortable under the gazes of the onlookers, it vanished from the dining table. Open it, Blake, Marcus urged, eager to see if the package indeed contained a broom. Without hesitation, Blake unwrapped the package right there on the dining table, revealing a stunning, metallic broom. Wow! This is incredible, but what kind of broom is this? I've never seen anything like it, he marveled. The broom, with its sleek metallic design, was unlike any he had encountered before. Blake, who had always felt a peculiar disconnect from wooden objects, found this metallic broom resonating with him. Upon closer inspection, Blake recognized the craftsmanship. This isn't just any broom. It's been crafted with exceptional alchemy, he realized, astounded. It was a creation of Nicholas Flamel himself, devoid of any model number due to its unique origin. While others were captivated by the broom's exquisite appearance, Blake was intrigued by the alchemical mastery it represented. Gazing thoughtfully at the broom in his hands, Blake caught Dumbledore's eye, who looked back at him with a sense of relief. It was a significant moment. Nicole Flamel had crafted Blake's broom personally. This gesture signified that Blake had earned Nicole Flamel's full acceptance, Hazim, a feat Dumbledore couldn't quite fathom how the young wizard had achieved. Nicole Flamel, renowned for his alchemical prowess, had never before taken it upon himself to create an alchemical artifact for personal use. After dinner, let's take it for a spin, Marcus said, his fists clenched in excitement. Sure, Blake agreed without hesitation. Flying on the broom would not only be exhilarating, but also an opportunity to test its capabilities. More importantly, it would offer him insights into Nicole Flamel's alchemical techniques, a prospect that intrigued him deeply. The idea of flying on a broom crafted by an alchemist as legendary as Nicole Flamel was thrilling. Blake knew that every curve, every enchantment woven into the broom, held secrets of ancient alchemy waiting to be unraveled. This wasn't just a test of the broom's performance. It was a chance to connect with the very essence of alchemy that Nicole Flamel had mastered over centuries. As the evening approached, anticipation grew. The thought of soaring through the sky on a masterpiece of alchemy, feeling the wind rush past, 
and experiencing the freedom of flight filled Blake with an indescribable excitement. This was more than just a flight. It was a journey into the heart of alchemy itself. Chapter 97. Dumbledore's Surprise A cool breeze swept across the Quidditch pitch as Blake soared freely on a broom crafted by Nicholas Flamel. He was thoroughly impressed. The broom could handle his maximum magical output without a hitch. Unlike when casting spells with his mithril wand, which often heated up and emitted a beeping sound under strain, this broom remained as stable as a mountain. Clearly, Nicholas Flamel's craftsmanship was unparalleled. Despite its unremarkable speed compared to Harry's Nimbus 2000, for Blake, this broom was exceptional. To others, using his wand felt like wielding an unwieldy 80 caddy knife, utterly ineffective. Similarly, no one else could harness the full power of this broom. In Flamel's eyes, Blake was the ideal conduit for this magnificent broom, a perfect match for its capabilities. With a burst of speed, Blake pushed the broom to its limits, leaving onlookers in awe. I felt like I was watching a low-flying jet plane, one spectator remarked. What's a jet plane? Another asked, puzzled. Review your muggle studies, Marcus chided, squeezing Cedric's shoulder in excitement. With this speed and skill, we're unbeatable. Cedric managed to wriggle free from Marcus's grip, nursing his sore shoulder. He marveled at how Blake had effortlessly taken down Marcus, a feat that seemed impossible given Marcus's muscular build. The dueling club had become an overnight sensation at Hogwarts, attracting nearly all the students. The novelty of dueling had captivated even those with little interest in the sport, making the club the largest society at Hogwarts and surpassing the Gobstone Club. Blake had successfully fulfilled Quirrell's assignment. Meanwhile, Quirrell was locked in his office, conversing with his reflection in a mirror. He expressed confusion to Voldemort, hidden within his scarf, about the undue attention Blake was receiving. Voldemort explained that Blake's talent, coupled with his naivety, made him an easy target for manipulation. More importantly, Dumbledore's unusual interest in Blake hinted at a deeper connection. Quirrell was shocked to realize that Blake might be the child Dumbledore had adopted, making him a potential vulnerability for the otherwise formidable headmaster. Voldemort saw this as an opportunity to exploit Dumbledore's newfound weakness, drawing parallels to his manipulation of Barty Crouch Jr. He believed that even someone as principled as Dumbledore could be swayed by the prospect of protecting a loved one, suggesting a sinister plan was in motion to use Blake against him. Voldemort, brimming with confidence, declared, This is our chance. Quirrell, in a hushed tone, agreed, Yes, Master, you will undoubtedly succeed. However, Voldemort paid little attention to Quirrell's praise, instead revealing, Actually, today brought an unexpected opportunity. Quirrell, intrigued, asked, What is it? That broom, the one Blake Green received. Did you see it? Voldemort inquired. Yes, Master, Quirrell responded. It's a broomstick crafted by an alchemist, Voldemort revealed. Quirrell was puzzled, thinking it normal for Dumbledore's adopted child to receive such a gift, assuming Dumbledore would spare no expense. Voldemort, reading Quirrell's thoughts, chastised him. Fool, why don't you see? If Dumbledore wanted to gift his adopted child a broomstick, he wouldn't need someone else to make it. He's a master alchemist himself. Moreover, if Dumbledore had made the broom, he wouldn't have had it delivered by a phoenix in the Great Hall. He could have given it to Blake Green privately. The fact that it was sent by mail suggests it was made for Blake by someone else. I suspect. It's a gift. A gift from Dumbledore's alchemist friend to Blake Green. Quirrell gasped. Nicholas Flamel? Exactly. The broom was most likely sent by him. If that's the case, it implies Nicholas Flamel holds Blake in high regard, Otherwise, he wouldn't personally craft such an extravagant gift for a child, Voldemort explained. With this revelation, Quirrell Ree allies the significance of Blake Green's relationship with Nicholas Flamel. This connection could potentially lead them to the Sorcerer's Stone, which Dumbledore had secured on the fourth floor with various protective measures, including Quirrell's own contributions. However, the authenticity of the stone Dumbledore placed there remained questionable. So, Master, why did you suggest he form a society? Quirrell inquired. I want him to experience the exhilaration of being admired for his strength. Trust me, Quirrell, no one can resist that feeling. It's the first step in winning him over, 
Voldemort shared. Quirrell, astonished, realized. So when you teach him to duel in class, you're doing your utmost to nurture his talent? Indeed, despite his raw skills, Blake shows exceptional talent, surpassing even Barty Jr., Voldemort acknowledged, keeping to himself the broader implications of Blake's influence. Once Blake gained a significant reputation at Hogwarts and the admiration of his peers, his ideas could sway many. Voldemort envisioned Blake as not only a potential ally, but also a weapon against Dumbledore, reminiscent of Barty Jr.'s betrayal of his father. This strategy presented a no-lose situation for Voldemort, who also harbored a fascination with Blake's unique power, especially after experiencing its effects firsthand. Voldemort concluded that Blake was akin to a treasure trove. By winning him over, they could swiftly turn the tide in their favor, reaping immense benefits. Next, what should we do? Blake inquired, his curiosity piqued by the unfolding plan. The next step is to wait. If Blake Green seeks you out, then we're halfway to our goal, Voldemort explained with a hint of anticipation in his voice. Why is that? Blake asked, genuinely puzzled. Because he is the chairman of a significant society. However, if the chairman lacks dueling skills, convincing the public of his competence will be challenging, Voldemort elaborated. Therefore, if he approaches you for private training, it will prove his vulnerability to the allure of power. I see, Blake murmured, the gears turning in his head. And if he doesn't come? Blake pressed, seeking clarity on all possible outcomes. Then he will likely lose his position as chairman. It would also indicate his indifference towards power. Such a person would merely serve as a tool for my plans. But trust me, nobody is immune to the temptation of power, Voldemort confidently asserted. As Quirrell, under Voldemort's influence, pondered these plans, a knock echoed through the office. Could that be him? Quirrell wondered aloud, a mix of excitement and apprehension in his voice. Let me handle this. Voldemort decided, taking full control of Quirrell's body, to greet their visitor. Upon opening the door, they were met by Blake, who had skillfully activated his intermediate acting mastery skill, a talent he had honed alongside other abilities, such as proficiency with intermediate excavators. His expression was a calculated mix of nervousness, panic, and determination, convincing even to those who might have seen through lesser performances. Regrettably, Blake thought he lacked the natural disposition for a dramatic sigh, but his performance was convincing enough to deceive Voldemort, who refrained from using legitimacy. Blake did crave power, but not in the way Voldemort might have expected. The dueling club had proven beneficial, and he was not about to abandon his ambitions. His plan was to strike a deal with Voldemort, secure control of the dueling club, and claim it as his own once Quirrell was out of the picture. Blake had anticipated Voldemort's intentions and chose this moment to confront him. Oh, dear Blake, what brings you to me? Quirrell, Voldemort, inquired, feigning ignorance. Blake couldn't help but shiver at the overly affectionate address. Professor Quirrell, I seek to become stronger, he stated with unwavering resolve. A spark of interest flickered in Quirrell's, Voldemort's eyes. And why is that? What drives this desire? He probed, barely concealing his delight. I want to truly earn my title as chairman of the dueling club. I'm not yet strong enough. There are those who doubt my capabilities, Blake confessed, playing into Voldemort's expectations. I understand, Blake. Worry not, I will assist you in gaining the power you desire, Quirrell, Voldemort promised, a sinister undertone to his words. Following their conversation, Blake was instructed to visit Quirrell every night at 8 o'clock for dueling lessons. After sharing this development, Blake was rewarded with a golden treasure chest. Dumbledore, who had been listening, was left speechless by the revelation. Blake had not only uncovered Voldemort's ambitions, but had also become entangled in them. This was a development Dumbledore had hoped to avoid. Since you had already deduced his plan, you should have informed me first. I would never have exposed you to Quirrell had I known, Dumbledore lamented, realizing the complexity of the situation they now faced. Dumbledore had initially agreed to Blake's proposal of assisting Quirrell in establishing a dueling club, seeing it as a strategic move to monitor Quirrell's actions and, by extension, discern Voldemort's plans. He never intended for Blake to become deeply entangled in the situation. However, Blake's decision to seek out Voldemort directly 
had irrevocably changed the dynamics. Blake was now deeply involved, making it difficult to extricate him without raising Quirrell's suspicions. Dumbledore was silent, his mind racing with concerns. If it weren't for his fear that deviating from the prophecy could lead to unforeseen consequences, he might have considered bypassing Harry Potter altogether to confront Voldemort directly. You shouldn't have approached him, Blake, Dumbledore finally said, his voice tinged with a mixture of disappointment and concern. But, I wanted to help you, Blake protested, his voice earnest. He's trying to win me over, to turn me against you. I couldn't just stand by and do nothing. Looking into Blake's sincere eyes, Dumbledore felt a surge of mixed emotions. He was touched by Blake's loyalty and determination, yet he was also pained by the thought of Blake being in danger. Regardless, this is a perilous path you've chosen, Blake, Dumbledore said, his tone grave. Engaging directly with Voldemort and his followers puts you at great risk. Blake's decision to confront Voldemort was driven by a desire to protect Dumbledore and thwart Voldemort's plans. However, this bold move had inadvertently placed him in a precarious position, complicating Dumbledore's strategy and increasing the stakes of their covert battle against the Dark Forces. Chapter 98 Voldemort, are you determined enough to accept a stronger force? At least when most of his attention is focused on me, it will save everyone a lot of trouble, Blake said sincerely. Dumbledore looked at Blake, astonishment evident in his eyes. Is that really what you think? He asked, touched. What a kind-hearted child. Suddenly, a notification chimed in Blake's mind. An extremely moving emotion was detected. Congratulations to the host for receiving a golden treasure chest. Dumbledore, however, voiced his concerns. But have you considered the dangers of your actions? What if he discovers your true intentions, or worse, decides to harm you? Blake scratched his head, a bit embarrassed. I've thought about it, and I still chose to proceed. I guess I haven't dwelled much on the potential dangers. Dumbledore sighed, a mix of guilt and affection in his voice. You're such a naive boy. Another chime sounded in Blake's mind signaling the detection of emotions and the reward of another golden treasure chest. Despite the rewards, Blake felt a pang of guilt at Dumbledore's next words. No, I still can't condone this. It's too dangerous, and it's not your burden to bear. You shouldn't have to risk yourself, Dumbledore said, deeply moved by Blake's willingness but still unwilling to put him in harm's way. Dumbledore had lost too much in his life, including his sister Ariana, and he couldn't bear the thought of losing Blake, who had become like family to him. But Professor, what if it works? Blake asked, trying to present another perspective. With your help, wouldn't it succeed? Dumbledore countered, his determination clear. I just can't bear to put you in danger again. Professor, things are more complicated than you think. Even other professors have started to suspect your adoption of me. Don't you think he's aware of our relationship? Blake argued. The moment he changed his teaching approach and began favoring me, I knew I was on his radar. Avoiding involvement isn't an option anymore. If I'm destined to be dragged into this, I'd rather dive in headfirst and take control. Blake's calm and logical explanation left Dumbledore in shock. The child's wisdom and courage were beyond his years, embodying the virtues of all four Hogwarts houses. It was clear why the sorting hat had placed him in Hufflepuff, Blake's kindness, loyalty, intelligence, curiosity, bravery, and cunning made him a perfect fit for the inclusive house. Professor? Blake's voice pulled Dumbledore from his thoughts. Realizing his lapse, Dumbledore responded, You're right, Blake. Perhaps I should be more discreet about our relationship to protect you. Blake shook his head. It's not your fault, Professor. And why should we hide? An elder adopting a child as his heir is nothing to be ashamed of. Why should we keep it a secret? Because of enemies? I refuse to live in hiding. Blake's words resonated with Dumbledore, highlighting the boy's bravery and conviction. Despite the dangers, Blake was ready to face them head-on, embodying the true spirit of a hero. In the midst of a complex situation, Blake found himself in a conversation with Professor Dumbledore, discussing the precarious position they were in regarding Voldemort. Dumbledore, with a heavy heart, looked at Blake, marveling at the young boy's willingness to shoulder such a heavy burden. Blake, however, reassured him, outlining a strategy that involved playing a delicate game of deception with Voldemort, 
he proposed to feign dissatisfaction with Dumbledore to keep Voldemort's interest in winning him over, thus keeping himself out of immediate danger. Dumbledore, though resigned, acknowledged Blake's astuteness in uncovering Voldemort's scheme so swiftly and urged him to remain vigilant. Dumbledore then mentioned he had something to prepare for Blake, something crucial for his protection, especially when facing Professor Quirrell. This item, revealed to be a pair of glasses, was designed to shield Blake from Voldemort's potential use of legilimency, a magic all skill that allows one to probe into another's mind. Despite Blake's proficiency in occlumency, a defensive countermeasure to legilimency, the glasses served as an additional layer of protection, at Dumbledore's insistence. Blake, who had never worn glasses before, found himself needing to explain the sudden change to his friends. He concocted a simple yet plausible explanation, attributing his newfound need for glasses to the extensive reading he had been doing. This explanation was readily accepted by his friends, given Blake's known diligence in his studies and the commonality of nearsightedness among wizards, a condition not easily remedied in their world. As Blake continued his dueling lessons with Quirrell, who was under Voldemort's control, he noticed that the lessons were focused on legitimate defense against the dark arts spells and combat skills, with no instruction in dark magic. Blake interpreted this as Voldemort's way of testing him, gauging his ambition and desire for power. This insight into Voldemort's intentions revealed the complexity of their interactions, with each move carefully calculated to navigate the dangerous game they were playing. Blake found himself in a difficult position. He was determined to prove himself to Voldemort, yet the task at hand was daunting. That evening, in a dimly lit room, he stood before Professor Quirrell, who was, in fact, Voldemort in disguise. The air was thick with anticipation as Blake broached the subject of learning more powerful spells. Professor Quirrell, these spells... Blake hesitated, searching for the right words. What are you trying to say? Quirrell, with Voldemort's cold and calculating voice, inquired. Blake noticed a change in Quirrell's demeanor. The man hardly bothered to maintain his usual facade in front of him. Although I've learned a great deal of advanced combat techniques from you, Blake began, his voice growing more confident. I, I want to become stronger. Do you have any more powerful spells to teach me? Quirrell, or rather Voldemort, seemed to ponder this for a moment. Yes, there are more powerful spells, but are you truly prepared for what they entail? Blake nodded without hesitation, his resolve clear. Very well, Quirrell conceded. I will teach you a spell of greater power. Your willingness to try will be the true test of your determination. Blake understood that this was yet another of Voldemort's tests. The spell he was about to learn was undoubtedly dark magic possibly even one of the three unforgivable curses. Such magic required the caster to harbor intense negative emotions, like deep-seated hatred or a strong desire to kill. Failure to harness these emotions would render the spell ineffective and diminish Voldemort's interest in him. Blake was determined not to let that happen. He knew that to maintain Voldemort's interest, he had to prove his worth. Otherwise, he risked being discarded like Quirrell. Quirrell raised his wand and aimed it at a wooden target a short distance away. Pay attention to the incantation, he instructed. Cut out the guts, he exclaimed, and with a loud crack, a gaping hole appeared in the dummy's abdomen, its insides hollowed out. Blake frowned, repulsed by the spell's gruesome nature. He was familiar with it, but had never had the inclination to use it due to its vile and bloody effects. Yet, here he was, being tested on his aptitude for dark arts with this very curse. Your turn, Quirrell urged. Remember, you must feel enough hatred in your heart to want to eviscerate your opponent. Blake took a deep breath, yeah, mentally cursing Voldemort for putting him through this. He focused, channeling his emotions, and pointed his mithril wand at another intact dummy. With a mixture of determination and revulsion, he uttered the spell, dug out the intestines and cut out the belly. Chapter 99. The Prodigy of Dark Magic With a resounding crack, Blake unleashed a devastating spell, the gut ejaculation curse, on the wooden target. In an instant, a gaping hole appeared in its belly. Then, with a sharp click, the upper half of the target cleanly separated from the rest, having been sliced in half by the curse with precision. 
it was evident that Blake's mastery of the dark spell surpassed that of Voldemort's influence on Quirrell. Quirrell, limited by his own capabilities, could only channel a fraction of Voldemort's power. In contrast, Blake, wielding this dark magic for the first time, outperformed Quirrell significantly. This feat not only demonstrated Blake's innate talent for dark magic, but also hinted at a potential that was bursting at the seams. Voldemort, observing from afar, couldn't contain his excitement. He saw in Blake a natural-born dark wizard, one whose potential for embracing the dark arts was limitless. Now, Voldemort's task was to unlock the Pandora's box within Blake's heart, to unleash his innermost desires and evil inclinations, much like he had once done with Barty Crouch Jr. If successful, not even Dumbledore would be able to prevent Blake's descent into darkness. On the contrary, Dumbledore's attempts to intervene might only hasten Blake's fall. As Blake contemplated his achievement, a notification chimed in his mind. Ding! An extremely joyful emotion was detected, followed by, Ding! Congratulations to the host for getting a golden treasure chest. Blake mused over Voldemort's reaction, noting the Dark Lord's attempt to remain composed despite his evident joy, which resulted in only a golden treasure chest being awarded. Blake ambitiously thought, Sooner or later, I will make you yield the supreme treasure chest. Looking at the destroyed wooden target, Blake found himself puzzled. He had merely tapped into his acting skills, yet the spell's power was overwhelming. His proficiency in acting had significantly aided his ability to harness negative emotions, which, in turn, amplified the spell's potency. By immersing himself in the role of a deranged individual with a perverse joy in gutting, Blake had unleashed a spell of terrifying strength, leaving even Voldemort ecstatic. This led Blake to question his own aptitude for dark magic, though he quickly dismissed the thought, humorously considering himself a harmless little badger. However, this experience illuminated for Blake the idealistic nature of magic in this world, where the intensity of one's emotions directly influenced the power of their spells. This was true for both dark magic, requiring malevolent intent for spells like Avada Kedavra and the Cruciatus Curse, and positive magic, where spells like the Patronus thrived on happiness. An intriguing thought crossed Blake's mind. If someone were to cast dark curses in a state of madness, would his system reward him with treasure chests for the emotional intensity directed at oneself? Quirrell, mistaking Blake's contemplative silence for awe at his own spell's power, allowed himself a slight smile, believing Blake longed for such power. Very well, Blake, you've shown me your resolve, Quirrell said, planning to teach Blake more the following night. He admired Blake's quick adaptation and emotional control, seeing great potential in him for the dark arts. Thus, Blake's journey into the depths of magic continued, with each spell casting and emotional exploration opening new doors to understanding and power, all while under the watchful eye of those who sought to guide him down a darker path. Blake, having experimented with black magic on a wooden target, resolved never to use it on a living being, recognizing the potential for horrific outcomes. After the experiment, he didn't return to his dormitory. Instead, he made his way to the Room of Requirement, emerging with a small, oddly lustrous ball. Utilizing materials found within the room, he had synthesized two Pokeballs of normal quality. One was designated for Xiong Da, hoping it might unlock new Potenchi, Al in the creature whose abilities had seemed maxed out. The other was reserved for a more ambitious target, the King of the Horned Camel Beasts. The following day, a Saturday free from the usual academic obligations, Blake organized a barbecue outside Hagrid's cabin. The guest list included a few friends who had supported Blake in promoting the dueling club, such as Cassandra, Hermione, and Hannah, alongside first-time attendees like Cedric, Pinello, Marcus, Wynne, and Roger. Hagrid, contributing privately sourced ingredients for the event, extended invitations to Harry and his close friend Ronald as well. Blake, known among his friends for his exceptional cooking skills, took charge of the barbecue. As the meat sizzled on the grill, he retreated to Hagrid's hut to prepare desserts, his culinary expertise promising an array of tantalizing flavors. The aroma wafting from the grill and the hut was so enticing that it tested the patience of those who had yet to experience Blake's cooking. Wayne, unable to contain his eagerness, suggested he taste the food first, 
claiming his discerning palate could judge its readiness. Hagrid, however, firmly stationed himself by the grill, insisting on following Blake's instructions to the letter. He recalled past instances when impatience led to less-than-perfect barbecue experiences and how waiting for the right moment significantly enhanced the taste. This memory bolstered his resolve to wait, assuring everyone that the brief delay would be well worth it. When Blake finally emerged from the hut, he inspected the meat on the grill and added a final touch with a sprinkle of unknown spices. Only then did Hagrid serve the barbecue, which was met with overwhelming approval. Marcus was moved to tears by the flavor, lamenting the missed opportunities to enjoy such culinary delights sooner. Wayne and Roger expressed similar sentiments, regretting not having experienced Blake's cooking despite sharing a dormitory with him. Cedric, more reserved but equally impressed, quietly enjoyed the barbecue, prioritizing eating over expressing his astonishment. Pinello, taking small, appreciative bites, regretted missing a previous dinner invitation from Blake, now fully aware of what she had missed. The meal concluded with Blake presenting his homemade desserts, which, like the barbecue, earned him high praise. The combination of crispy sweet treats and the savory barbecue solidified Blake's reputation as an exceptional cook, leaving his friends eagerly anticipating their next meal together. Blake sat leisurely, cradling a cup of tea, savoring its warmth and aroma. In the quiet of the moment, he delved into his system space, a treasure trove of rewards he had amassed from his adventures and encounters with figures like Dumbledore and Voldemort. Among these, he had managed to craft two more coveted diamond chests, setting aside the silver and bronze ones. He had learned, through experience, that these lesser chests often contained basic materials and skills of unexpected utility. For instance, his proficiency in intermediate acting skills, initially deemed trivial, had proven invaluable when combined with spellcasting. Hermione, observing Blake lost in thought, mistook his contemplation for concern. What's troubling you? She inquired, her curiosity piqued. Blake, pulling himself back from his reverie, responded, I've been pondering over a question. And what might that be? Hermione asked, her interest evident. How many uses does dragon's blood have? Blake mused, his tone serious. Hermione, taken aback, replied, but the thirteen uses of dragon's blood were discovered by Dumbledore and his colleagues. Didn't you struggle to recall them during Snape's potion class? Exactly, Blake affirmed, which is why I'm contemplating a fourteenth use for dragon's blood. This revelation left Hermione and those who overheard in astonishment. The prospect of discovering a new application for such a well-studied potion ingredient was both daunting and thrilling. So, what is this new use? Hermia, he pressed, her eyes wide with anticipation. The others, too, leaned in, eager to hear of this groundbreaking discovery. Blake, pausing for effect, finally spoke. Have any of you ever tried Mao Shui Wang? As night descended, Blake bid farewell to his friends and made his way to the forbidden forest's edge, his heart warmed by the thought of the power he sought, not through dark magic, but through the mastery of magical creatures, plants, and alchemy. His ambitions, he felt, far exceeded those of Voldemort. Ensuring solitude, Blake donned his invisibility cloak, cast a bubblehead charm for protection, and took to the skies with the levitation ability of his cloak. His destination, the beach by the Forbidden Forest, where he planned to tame a llama. Under the moon's glow, Blake revealed himself at the cave's entrance, confident that the horned llama within would detect his presence. As anticipated, the sound of heavy footsteps approached, and soon, a towering horned llama emerged, its demeanor cautious yet curious, thanks to Blake's unique archdruid aura. Blake stood unguarded before the creature, a smile gracing his lips. Yet, the llama sensed the latent danger. A smaller llama, perhaps a third the size of the first, joined the scene, its gaze fixed on Blake. It observed the standoff but hesitated to act, intrigued by this unfamiliar human. In front of it, the horned camel suddenly let out a roar. To most, it was merely an ordinary sound. However, to Blake, who possessed the unique ability to understand the language of animals, it conveyed a clear message. Humans, standing before you is the king of the Purple Horn tribe, the sovereign of the eastern forest, El Marchetit Agkarius, the horned camel announced. Human, who might you be, to stand in the presence of our clan's king and yet not introduce yourself? 
Blake was momentarily taken aback. Goodness, whose name could possibly be longer, and are we really going to compete over this? He thought to himself. Clearing his throat, Blake prepared his response with a hint of theatrical flair. Let it be known to the king before me, Blake began, his voice resonating with a newfound gravity. Standing before you is none other than the Thunderborn Lord of the Hogwarts Houses, the King of Beasts, the unyielding sovereign of the Forbidden Forest, the ruler of the Tree Guard tribe, the Lord of the Phoenix, the black and white son of the devil, Gellert Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Blake Dumbledore Grindelwald. Upon hearing Blake's elaborate introduction, the horned camels were visibly astounded. Their mouths hung open in disbelief. Although the significance of many titles was lost on them, the sheer grandiosity of Blake's claimed identities was unmistakable. The king born from thunder, what brings you to our domain? The horned camel king inquired, his tone now laced with a genuine curiosity and respect. Blake's response had not only bridged the gap between their worlds, but also paved the way for a dialogue underpinned by mutual recognition of sovereignty. What had begun as a potentially hostile encounter was now evolving into an exchange between two leaders, each with their own storied titles and realms. Chapter 100 Accidentally Tamed Another Brood The new king of the Purple Horn tribe. I am determined to achieve great things, and you, my favorite, will be an invaluable ally in realizing my ambitions, Blake declared with earnest conviction. How presumptuous! Do you dare attempt to tame our lord? This is a grave insult to us. An ordinary horned camel bellowed, its roar reverberating through the sky. At this signal, a large group of horned camels emerged from the woods and hidden caves along the beach, all fixing their intense gazes on Blake. It seemed they were ready to pounce at any moment and tear him to shreds. King born of thunder, you wish to tame me? The king of the horned camels asked, eyeing Blake with a dangerous look. Yes, Blake responded calmly. If you are unconvinced, let your clansmen come at me. However, I must warn you, as the king born of thunder, I will inevitably cause significant casualties among your tribe. The horned camel king surveyed his tribe, a flicker of doubt crossing his eyes. This human's boldness in facing them alone suggested a formidable power. Such a confrontation could indeed lead to heavy losses for his people. As the king of the purple horn tribe, he possessed an inviolable majesty. Allowing his clansmen to rush forward in a futile attack would only diminish his stature as their leader. With a low growl, he signaled for the horned camels to step back and lower their heads. Fight me, king born of thunder. If you defeat me, I will follow you. But if you lose, you will perish here, the horned camel king proposed, having weighed his options carefully. Victory would resolve the matter favorably, but defeat would not justify a reckless assault by his tribe which would only result in unnecessary bloodshed. Blake chuckled, appreciating the king's noble stance. He had initially planned to use a pokeball for a forceful taming, but now he decided to honor the king's dignity with a fair challenge. Very well, I accept your challenge, Blake agreed. My king, you need not fight him, a llama named Acaster protested. Stand down, Acaster. Do you doubt my strength? The king dismissed Acaster's concern, and stepped forward with regal dignity. In the Horned Camel tribe, where strength was paramount, showing weakness was not an option. The king fixed a silent, predatory gaze on Blake, its sharp horns glowing with a golden light that showcased its formidable destructive power. Blake, taking the challenge seriously, drew his mithril wand, recalling how he had once sent a mountain giant flying tens of meters away. The thought of the giant's immense weight and the power required to launch it such a distance filled him with a sense of the impending battle's intensity. With a lightning coil wrapped around his wand, Blake prepared for the confrontation. The horned camel king's pupils contracted at the sight. This human's ability to wield the power of thunder was indeed formidable. The aura emanating from the silver stick was disconcerting, suggesting that the king himself might not withstand many hits. Acknowledging Blake's strength, the Horned Camel King realized the wisdom in facing him alone. The king halted, his purple pupils intently focused on Blake, deciding to rely on his speed to gain the upper hand before Blake could unleash his thunderous power. With a sudden burst of speed, the Horned Camel King charged, moving as swiftly as lightning. Blake, 
wearing a levitating cloak, swiftly ascended into the air, narrowly avoiding the attack. The king's incredible speed was evident, highlighting the threat he posed. Suspended in the air, Blake's cape billowed around him. He raised his wand, ready to cast a powerful weather spell. Thunderstorms quickly gathered, enveloping him in a display of raw elemental power. From a distance, Blake resembled a deity wielding the forces of nature, ready to engage in an epic battle with the king of the horned camels. As if the god of thunder himself had descended upon the world, the scene was electrifying. The horned camel king, upon halting, cast a backward glance filled with despair. The realization dawned on him. His opponent could fly, wielding a thunderous power beyond comprehension. The king knew that when Blake swung his right hand down, it could very well signal his own demise. Boom! 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 Despite the odds, the horned camel king charged once more, this time leaping towards Blake in a last-ditch effort to reach him. The jump was higher than anyone, including Blake, had anticipated. However, it was still not enough. Unfortunately, compared to my lightning, you are too slow, Blake remarked as lightning struck the horned camel king mid-air. The brilliant flash forced all the horned camels to shield their eyes. When they reopened their eyes, the sight that greeted them was one of despair. Their once mighty king now lay motionless on the sand. Blake descended gracefully from the sky, addressing the fallen king. Horned camel king, do you concede? A caster, a common horned camel, roared in frustration. You can fly! My king cannot! A caster, flying is a skill, just as I pride myself on my speed, the horned camel king interjected, attempting to rise. O king born of thunder, you have bested me. I shall aid you in your noble quest. Moreover, by defeating me, you have earned the right to be the new king of our Zijiao tribe, as per our customs. Blake looked down at the horned camel king with a mix of surprise and skepticism. Cunning Agcarius, you wish for me to protect your tribe? The horned camel king, now identified as Agcarius, met Blake's gaze. Thunderborn king, by defeating me, you inherit the mantle of our tribe's king. The choice to protect the purple horn tribe or leave is yours. With a wave of his wand, Blake cast a potent healing spell, enhanced by druidic magic, upon Agcarius. The king watched in awe as his wounds healed instantly, his respect for Blake deepening. Very well. I accept your proposition, Blake declared, rising into the air once more. People of the Purple Horn tribe, I have defeated your king, Agcarius. I am your new king. Should anyone challenge this, let them step forward. The horned camels exchanged glances, but none dared to challenge Blake. Their king, the strongest in centuries, had been defeated. How could they hope to stand against this human, a master of thunder? Soon after, the tribe bowed their heads in submission to Blake. Agcarius, now fully acknowledging Blake's new status, inquired, My king, what will become of us? Blake surveyed the horned camels with a determined gaze. Recognizing their combat prowess, but understanding he couldn't oversee them directly, he decided, let them continue to recuperate here. Acasta, you and Agcarius will protect the Purple Horn tribe in my stead. Should you encounter any insurmountable trouble? He then produced a small piece of mithril, letting it float before him. With a gentle rub of his hands, a group of crimson flames appeared, startling Agcarius with its intensity. The mithril gradually morphed under the ancient fire into two badges, each engraved with the image of a horned camel. Blake picked up the badges, and with his wand in hand, prepared to entrust them with a significant responsibility. Blake lightly tapped on the two badges, placing one in front of a caster. If you encounter trouble that you can't handle, just step on this badge. It will alert me that you're in need of assistance, Blake explained, as he pocketed the other badge. This device was a simple piece of alchemy, enhanced with an advanced transformation spell to link the two badges together, enabling a basic form of communication. Should a caster step on his badge, the one in Blake's possession would heat up, signaling an alarm. As you command, my king, a caster responded, his gaze briefly meeting Agcarius's before he skillfully rolled up the badge with the tentacles near his mouth. The horned camel's tentacles were as dexterous as human fingers, a trait Blake knew was often used to manipulate their food, typically fresh fish, into their mouths. With that settled, let's depart, Blake announced. Agcarius cast a lingering look at his former ally. A caster, my instincts compel me to leave. Do not despair. 
Wang and I must go first. Take good care of our clan, he advised before he and Blake ventured into the forbidden forest, disappearing from the sight of the horned camels. Once enveloped by the forest's dense foliage, Agcarius inquired, My lord, what is our destination now? Blake retrieved a pokeball, eyeing Agcarius. Stand still, I want to test this. He said, his curiosity piqued about the device's capabilities. With a gentle twist and a toss, the pokeball engulfed Agcarius in a flash, shrinking him and teleporting him inside the ball before returning to Blake's hand. Observing the pokeball, Blake noticed the previously dim gemstones now glowing green, indicating a successful capture. Peering into the pokeball, Blake could make out a miniature Agcarius, peacefully asleep, enveloped in a red mist that seemed to be a substance promoting biological evolution. This appears to be a conversion of ordinary magic into a form that encourages biological growth, akin to druidic magic, Blake mused, impressed by the device's potency. Releasing Agcarius, Blake instructed, Next time I summon you for an attack, do so immediately. Agcarius, still bewildered by the experience, nodded in understanding after Blake explained the Pokeball's function and its potential to enhance his strength. Mounting Agcarius, Blake commanded, Forward! And they charged deeper into the Forbidden Forest, heading straight into Acromantula territory. This time, Blake remained passive as Agcarius, empowered and acting like a formidable tank, repelled any approaching spiders, inflicting heavy casualties among the Acromantula. Blake harbored no sympathy for these creatures, viewing them merely as a source of wealth. His plan was to raise a particularly strong Acromantula, one that would eventually overthrow Aragog and claim the throne, uniting the Acromantula under a new king. Meanwhile, an old man stood beside a large pit in a different part of the forest, lamenting the absence of Porgy's relatives. In his hand, he held... A bow truckle scratched its head in confusion. No. My second uncle lives here? Why is the whole tree gone? The old man crouched down, equally puzzled, as he stared at the large pit before him. He distinctly remembered a holly tree standing here, its branches teeming with bow truckles. This community had existed for decades, and he would visit them from time to time. But now, not only had the bow truckle vanished, but the tree itself was nowhere to be found. Don't worry, Porgy, I'll find out what happened to them. The old man said, his brow furrowed with concern. A sense of foreboding filled his heart. Bowtruckles were indeed a rare species, making them prime targets for poachers who would capture these magical creatures to sell to greedy goblins at exorbitant prices. Goblins would then train the bowtruckles to assist in their nefarious lock-picking endeavors. The disappearance of an entire holly tree only added to his worry. He didn't want to believe it, but the evidence was clear. They had been taken captive. The value of the bow truckles and their home trees was too great for poachers to ignore. Just as he was grappling with this distressing thought, a series of thunderous footsteps echoed in the distance. It's the footsteps of a horned camel, the old man exclaimed, his expression turning grave. Judging by the sound, this horned camel was significantly larger than the norm. Without hesitation, the old man tucked Porgy away for safety and dashed toward the source of the noise. Suddenly, a massive tree was snapped in half right before his eyes. A gigantic horned camel lumbered past, its presence alone a spectacle to behold. The old man's eyes widened in astonishment, not just at the sight of the creature, but because he spotted a child perched on the back of the horned camel. The situation was extraordinary, and the old man knew that this was no ordinary encounter. The presence of the sea, hilled on such a majestic creature, hinted at a story far beyond what he had initially imagined. Determined to unravel the mystery, he prepared to follow the horned camel, his mind racing with questions about the child's identity and how it all connected to the disappearance of the bow truckles and their home.